If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Our guest today is Steve Halfpenny. Steve started off as a Western rider and competitor before focusing on teaching people about their horses. He has been teaching horsemanship now for about 30 years. He's done quite a lot of public and conducted horsemanship clinics and has started over 500 horses. He conducts these clinics in Europe, South Africa, New Zealand and Australia. And he's also been presented at Equitana Australia quite a few times, as well as Equidays in New Zealand. How are you today, Steve? I'm good, thanks. Good, good. Steve, we normally start off with a favourite quote. Have you got one for us? Yeah, I think the thing that sticks in my mind is for things to change for you, first you must change. Yes, yes. And I think that's particularly relevant to horses too, isn't it? You know, sometimes people think that the horse has got to magically change without them doing anything different. Yes, yeah, sort of amazes me how, you know, people keep doing the same thing over and over and over and hoping for different results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Now, when did you first hear this or did someone tell you or how did you come across it? I think when I got into horsemanship, I started really to realise it was all about self-improvement. And that's sort of been a lot of the self-improvement things. That's one of the first things they say. The first thing that needs to change is us. You know, yes. if we want a better result, then we need to make a change in ourselves. Yep, yep. All right. And then tell me about, like, you first started off riding, competing in Western Do you remember your first memories of having anything to do with horses? You know, the first time you touched a horse, the first time you had horses in your life? Yeah, it was pretty late getting into horses. You know, in England, I grew up in England and there was a little farm behind the fence and I used to watch the tractors and a couple of the horses and I get to touch one every now and then, but I didn't really have much to do with them until I got married. Mm -hmm. And then my wife, one of the first conditions she said when we got married was, I need to have some dogs and I need to have some horses. <laughs> so I said, okay. And then it became clear if I didn't get a horse, basically I wasn't going to see much of her. She'd just <laughs> come home and have dinner and be gone. Going and that would be a horse. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. You know, people start off different stories. But yeah, yeah, I don't know that we've had one quite like that before. <laughs> yeah. What started? Was she interested in Western then? Because you started off riding Western. She was basically into English riding. Now, she grew up in England and then went to New Zealand where she had some ex race horses. Mm-hmm. And then when she came to Australia, they were in, the city, in Adelaide. And until she got married to me, there was no space in her life for horses again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was English type riding, you know, Jim Connors and shows. And one day we were at a show and I remember saying that one ring, the horses are, you know, rearing and carrying on and having trouble. And she looked across at the Western ring and they all seemed quiet and relaxed. Mm-hmm. And, she decided to get into that, so okay. whatever she decided to do, I guess I was going to do, so <laughs> <laughs> we both did it. All right. And then, you know, you're focusing on teaching. What brought that about? Because you would have already had some knowledge. What was the first lesson that you ever taught? Do you remember that? The first time you actually showed someone this is how you do it? Yeah, I, I do as a, a local guy, actually, and I realized that the things you, you spend a long time gathering all these bits of information and a lot of it is really hard to put into words. You know, I was trying to explain things like feel and timing and balance to this guy, and it was just a totally different language to him. So trying mm-hmm. to find a way of explaining things that didn't make sense to somebody else is really difficult. Mm-hmm. So you wouldn't have had a career with horses when you first came in to horses. But once you'd been teaching and you helped the local guy, probably helped a few other people, what was the decision then to start teaching professionally so that you actually earned an income from that what was the story there I think the public sort of drove me in that direction you know I had a job working with racehorses Mm -hmm. as a farrier mainly and then just helping out and that the boss there was really nice he let me take Mondays off and then he let me take Fridays off (laughs) (laughs) and then Tuesdays and Thursdays and yeah I remember him saying you're not going to be here long are you Mm, probably not. <laughs> so you really went into it and just started it part time, but the demand yeah, just it just grew going. and grew and grew and yeah. And then yeah. later in life, when I started to do, you know, I had a, a philosophy. I suppose if people wanted to find me, they'd find me. Mm-hmm. 
And then we did some of the bigger demonstrations and life just got a little crazy. So it's just mm -hmm. now I, I can't fit enough people in at the moment. So yep. traveling the world, trying to do my thing. Yeah, yeah. So for someone who wants to work with horses, you know, and they're just leaving school mm -hmm. and they may not have the skills that you've developed over the last 30 years, but what sort of core skills would they need and character traits, do you think, to make them successful in the horse industry? Looking back, what do you think you had that's made you successful? You know, just your core skills without all the knowledge that you've got now. I think... The mental state that you're in is, is massive, you know, if you're into the blame mentality, like it's really hard to fit in with around horses anyway. So you have to accept what they are. They're not human. They're not dogs. They're totally different species and they think totally differently. I think the more you think like a horse, the better you seem to be in life and business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, horses just okay. take you on face value, whereas humans have got all sorts of agendas. Yep, yep. The biggest skill would be just look for somebody that's already successful and you know if that's what you want to do sort of model yourself on them you need a mentor i think in life to mm -hmm. to follow until you find your own way mm -hmm. so someone who's already doing what you want to do yes and they've got the same sort of qualities you you want it's not just the results they're getting yes do you want to be like that do you want to act like that because some people are successful financially but I wouldn't like to be their horse. You know, that's just the way. Yeah, yeah. So it depends yeah. on which road you're planning on travelling along this horsemanship yeah. route. And Steve, what do you think then has been the best thing about working in the horse industry and, and working with people and horses and teaching and travelling the way that you are? What, what's been the best thing about it? You know, I used to think it was about helping horses was going to be my biggest thing. And I still mm -hmm. am really interested in helping horses the best way I can. But when you see a human do something that they thought they couldn't do, you know, and their eyes change. You just see their expression on their face when they feel something they never felt before. Mm. And some things that you can achieve with horses are really not in people's belief systems. You know, they're just not anywhere close to what they thought they could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can facilitate that, that's a great feeling, you know, and I'm looking yeah. to, to have that happen most weeks. So it's, it's pretty nice when it does. Mm -hmm. Just going back to the, um, the mentor you were talking about early, have there been people who've influenced you, helped you in your career? They have, yeah, early on. I guess when I was in the Western riding, I got a couple of books. You know, Tom, Tom Dance and Ray Hunt and some mm -hmm. of the early horsemanship books that were really hard to understand. And they're probably, they're, they're both dead, but they're probably still two of my biggest mentors now. Because mm. I, I read their little books, they're only, you know, you could read one on a weekend. But there's just so much food for thought in them. It just keeps you thinking about, which what am I missing still? Mm, mm. Mm. What about horses? Has there been a particular horse who you think has helped you along the way? Oh, definitely. There's two in my life. The first one was an Appaloosa that I had when we were in Western Riding. We sort of he came into our life through a lottery, basically. We won the service <laughs> and we were crazy. So we, we got this <laughs> Arabian mare that would hurt a few people. We thought, oh, she'll do for a brood mare. She's a giveaway. So we bred this beautiful young cult, but he was half Arabian and just full of life and more than I could really handle. But he was patient with me and he just apart from nearly killing me a few times, he told me to pay a lot more attention to what he was thinking and why he did what he did. So basically, mm -hmm. he, he changed me from, I guess, being a Western trainer, I was thinking of going in that route, to being more of a horseman and thinking more like, if I don't work out why he does what he does, nothing's going to change. And so it's one of those, if I don't keep changing, he's going to stay the way he is and I'm going to be complaining about him. Mm -hmm. and he turned out to be the horse that I could ride bareback and bridleless anywhere, just take him at the float didn't need anything on his head, just jump on and go mm -hmm. and ride him as well as I could with the saddle and a bridle. So yeah. he taught me what yeah. this connection could be. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I guess my mission is now, is how do you share that feeling with others? Yeah. Tell me about a time with him that you didn't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. I went to a, a clinic at the time, you know, I spent some time with Pat Pirelli and I went to a clinic and I was told, if you can't do these things by one of the other people by tomorrow, Pat's not going to like it. So I put a lot of pressure on my horse to go over some jumps and go in a trailer. And he's like, it was a different trailer. Mine, he would go in, you know, at Liberty. But this one, he went, don't want to go in there. I'm like, you can do it. Get in. Like, no, I can't. You can do it. Get in. Like, you kick me in the hand and drop me on the new knees. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. Went, okay. I guess I really wasn't listening. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't actually means can't. <laughs> okay. And then did you say there was two horses or he was the main one that you're pulling out? Well, there's another one coming to my life really recently. He's a, a whaler. And the whalers are very well known in Australia for being mounts for the light horse, mm. you know, during mm. the, the wars and things. And after they weren't needed anymore, they were just turned out basically and running as brumbies like wild horses. And Equitana decided they were going to take some of these horses and try and bring them in and put them in the hands of some trainers. And rather than have them cold as wild horses, they try and bring them in and find a life for them. So it was a good thought. But this particular one, Radar, he was called Coronation. He went to one of the trainers and he ended up really getting to be difficult. He was bucking her off and kicked her. So he came to me. And everything I thought I'd learned over the 30 years wasn't going to work. So he took me down a different route altogether. You know, I ended up talking to an American shaman, Lisa LaBelle, and she did what she called a soul regression on him, and he changed. So that was a, how does that work? Somebody talks to you on the telephone for a while, and you're different. Mm, mm. So for me, there's a spiritual side to the horsemanship now that I didn't really, I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking very physically, I suppose, on how to help them. Mm-hmm. So he's, yeah, he's been another change in how you feel about life and things <laughs> that you meet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Because you've done stacks of displays and displays all over the world. And as I said earlier, 500 horses or more. What do you think's been your proudest moment? The horse, one of the horses I'm riding now, and he's, mm-hmm. uh, he was given to us by somebody that really decided they didn't want him. And he was, I would have said, I would never change him like he's a problem horse. Mm-hmm. When he was born, I spoke to the breeder and said, when he was born, the mares had come around with all their foals and he'd run and hide. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah and she yeah. said she'd never seen one like that. You know, all the mares bring them up for, for some food. And if there was sure. a human there, he'd just run down the bottom and hide behind the trees. Mm, mm. So he's he's my display horse now, but it's taken me. He's 14 now. It's taken mm. me all this time for him to cope with humans mm. and the pressure of shows and things. Mm. And what he can do, he's not, you know, he's not doing everything else some of the horses in the world can do. He's given me a thousand percent. Mm-hmm. So I'm really proud of what he's done, and it's something that most of the public will never get to see. Yeah. Because it happens yeah. sort of at home. These changes don't happen at the shows. They happen behind mm. closed doors, basically. Mm. And they can be subtle, can't they, the changes? Yeah. You'd recognise the changes, but maybe a lot of people wouldn't. Yeah. I guess, you know, if you'd have asked me 15 years ago, I'd have said he won't ever get to where he is. Mm. But I'm a creature of habit, so I don't stop trying. You know, I just keep on working mm-hmm. on things anyway and go, well, well, we'll make you the best we can, but I don't think you'll ever make it. And he did. So I should be really careful yeah. what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Now, what do you think, you know, business-wise or getting to the point, not necessarily a horse problem or a horse challenge, what's been your biggest challenge to get to where you are now within your own career? Well, horse-wise is taking care of itself. I think business-wise, I'm a terrible businessman, I suppose, not taking help from people that offer it to me, <laughs> things like mm-hmm. that. I think I have to do everything myself. So recently I've got people in my life that appreciate what I do and I've had to take their help. Well, accept their help. They're always ready to help me. Yep. yep. And, yep. you know, they've taken the Facebook thing on and all that sort of stuff that I wasn't doing because I just didn't want to. Mm. Sounds like you just want to spend more time with horses and yeah. Not, yeah. not on Facebook. Yeah. 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 So business-wise, that all gets neglected because you just want to spend all your time with the horses. Mm, mm, mm. No, that's good. That's yeah. Good. So, you you know, it's been a challenge and then you've accepted. What made you accept that help? You know, was it something in particular, something someone said or did? It was actually, yeah, somebody that's been trying to help me for a while, you know, and, and probably financially it wasn't a problem for them to help me, but I, I was, you know, growing up in England, working class, and it's that if you don't change things... <laughs> Mm. And I hadn't changed that way. I just think everything you do, you have to work for. You've got to work hard for it, and it's all your own labor. And the person really wanted to help me. And it wasn't a big deal at the time. But for me, anything for nothing was was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And they initially said, you know, I feel really insulted that you won't take my help. <laughs> and I went, oh, <laughs> that definitely is not my intention. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I was thinking was I was being nice a person by put, you know, saying I don't want any help. But actually, mm. I was getting the opposite effects with the people I was talking to. It's like, well, I try to help you and just won't take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, looking at yourself again and thinking, boy, how many more changes yep. do I need to make in my life? Yeah. Embrace the changes. I do actually embrace the changes nowadays. Mm. Just mm. a little quicker to recognize them now than I used to be when I was a teenager. <laughs> All right. Now, 
taking it on the other foot, you know, you've sort of recognised that you need to do that in yourself and take help from people. What about other people that you're teaching, you know, your students, people, the riders, handlers, what's a common fault that you see with them that would make it better if they could communicate with their horse that way? You know, we want to know about the fault, but we also want to know how they can fix it. I think the attitude thing is a big thing. Like, there's no, mm-hmm. shouldn't be any blame. Yep. You know, whenever I hear horses are naughty and these sort of, you know, common words, I think that really seems like a blame mentality. As soon as the horse is na- naughty, then it's its fault. And actually, we're responsible for everything that they do. Then the other part is habits. You know, once you've developed a habit over, I don't know how many years we've been riding some others, a long time, even though somebody gives you some new information and you can take that on board and intellectually recite it back to the person that gave it to you, like if I gave it to you, they can recite it back to me. Mm-hmm. Then they believe they're doing what you've just told them. Mm-hmm. And often when I look at what's really going on, I think nothing has changed actually except what you're telling me. Yes. You're repeating what I've just told you to do. And you're mm. telling me that you're doing it, but you haven't changed. You're actually, your habits mm. are so strong mm. that they're over, like, like an overriding thing in behind you. I call it like an autopilot. You might think you've changed, but your autopilot keeps putting you back to your old habits and making you do what you've always done. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory and the practical components can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Okay, thanks. That's a good way to uh, explain it, I think. Yeah, I mean, the biggest change I ever make for people is if I can grab their hands, like walk alongside them and actually get them to feel what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then if the horse responds to me and they feel that, Mm. then you can see the, their eyes open and they're like, wow, what did you just do? Yeah, so a bit more showing rather than telling. Yeah, because words words are only take you so far. If they don't feel what you're doing, it takes forever. My journey took so long because nobody really did that with me. You know, I just tried by trial and error, trying to feel, is this right, is it wrong, until it got better and better and better. Mm-hmm. But if I could have had that, you know, somebody show me how everything felt, then I'm sure that would have been a real shortcut. So I really tried yeah. and help people not spend 30 years learning all this stuff. (laughs) Yep, yep. All right, Nesty, what are you looking forward to? What have you got that's coming up? Have you got some clinics or public displays or being a presenter anywhere? What's coming up there? Or what's coming up with your own horses? Well, there's a big deal for me, I suppose, this year. It was uh, we met a filmmaker in Ireland and she did a short clip for us and put it on Facebook and it went viral. Mm -hmm. And she said, I would like to come over and do a documentary. Oh, great. So she's just come back to Ireland. She's been over and she's filmed a whole lot of stuff and she's uh, putting a movie together. So she's going to do a documentary on me. Mm, mm. So that'll be different from hiding in the shadows. So actually, that, will be, that will be good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get you back to talk about the movie when it's out so we can give people the details yeah. of where they can see it. Mm, mm. Six months or so. But yeah. 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 So that's, that's big. And. I've got some mentors in my life that I still want to go and spend time with, so that's something to to look forward to when Mm -hmm. I finally slow down. (laughs) All right. Now, if you can sum up your philosophy, that would be great. Philosophy with horses and, um, you know, give us an overview. Yeah. I guess when I was reading about Tom Dorrance, they used to refer to Tom as the horse's lawyer. And I'm always trying to feel more and more like that's my job, you know, that's my philosophy is to represent the horse and explain to everybody what I think the horse is feeling about what's going on. So my philosophy, I guess, is I need to understand the horse completely Mm -hmm. so that as a teacher, I can pass that on to someone else. And there's no blame in me anymore. You know, it's sort of a strange place to be. I don't think I could never get hurt because that can happen, but there isn't any fear of the horse because I don't think they have any intention of hurting us. It's just a result of our lack of preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tom and Ray used to say, if you could come up with 5%, the horse would come up with 95%. Yep. And it seems to be such a hard deal for people to come up with that 5%. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to try and be the other way around. I'd like to, with the difficult horses in the world, can I come up with the 95 so they can just have to work out the 5? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, Steve, how can people contact you? I should say they can contact you via Horse Chat. So it'll be horsechats.com slash Steve Halfpenny or just go to horsechats.com and search for Steve. But if someone's got pen and paper with them right now and they can write this down, what are your details? 
Well, stevehalfpenny.com is my website, so all our information's on there. Mm-hmm. And our business, basically, I've renamed myself to Light Hands Equitation because I try to be more generic than just Western or English. Sure. So Facebook is Light Hands Equitation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. that yeah. sounds good. All yeah. right, and um, as I say, if you haven't got a pen on you or haven't written that down very quickly or can't remember, have a look at Horse Chats and just search for Steve. You'll find that. Steve, thanks very much for talking to us today. I'm looking forward to seeing you at one of your displays, hopefully, you know, round and about, and I'm sure that other people will be as well. And, uh, you know, seeing you working with horses and getting the best out of them and being their lawyer so you can understand them and, you know, represent the horse to the public. That's really good. Thank you for talking to us. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to catching up with you sometime. Good. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, before you go... If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 